Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God for giving us this opportunity to uh, share the Word of God and meditate upon it. Let us pray. Glory to God in the highest of your plan of salvation. And praise your holy name that you have become your children simply because we trusted in the saving work of Christ on Calvary. Thank you for laying out your wonderful plan in such a simple terms that even we can understand it. In his name we fully accept this glorious trustworth truth and able us to be a worthy witness of Christ's great redeeming sacrifice for the whole world that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. I will call Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God that comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 to 17. Brother Ben, please come and do the reading. Praise God, and I thank Johnson for uh, getting us to read the Word this week. I uh, love reading the, the Lord's Word and uh, getting into the Bible. I uh, pray that you're all being diligent scholars of the Word and getting in to all the different books and letting the Lord lead you there. As Johnson mentioned, uh, I'll be reading from 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 to 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he has considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honoured and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Praise be to God. I notice that we're back in the New Testament, Johnson, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we've spent a bit of time in the Old Testament, and I encourage you to go back and watch them YouTube. So uh, amazing messages, and we'll see what God's put on Johnson's heart this week. Johnson. <clears throat> um, my theme this morning is thank God we can change thank God we can change someone once said that the only constant in life is change no matter who you are one of the greatest challenges you will face is managing the change that takes place in your life we have limited control over some of the changes we face our hair changes color, sometimes falls out. We gain weight as we become less active and our metabolism slows. Our children grow up and move out of the house. The shifting economy may lead to layoffs and relocation. The death of a spouse or the breakdown of a marriage may result in radical changes in our living arrangements. And if that isn't enough, grandchildren come along to make us humble again. Most of us try to control the tempo of our lives. We do all we can to maintain the status quo. We might move to a larger home as our family grows. We relocate to get a better job if that is, seems appropriate. We make new friends as kids get involved in various activities. It could be sports, anything. We get involved in a church and attend worship regularly. Of course, most of us would rather nothing change and we try to keep this events at a minimum. We like doing the same old thing with the same old friends. We don't enjoy looking at new ideas. We don't want to have our attitudes challenged. I read somewhere that by the time we reach age 30, we are pretty much set in a pattern behavior 
of that will last us the rest of our lives. So the exception to the rule comes in one of the three ways. The first exception follows a life-changing event. Major changes often occur as a result of a wedding or the birth of a first child. A new job may also spark some big changes in an older worker. These events force everyone to look at life differently, but the changes are often more marked by older you are when the events occur. So the, the second exception comes after the experience of a tragedy, like a sudden death, loss of a body function, or as a result of a catastrophe event. All these are some of the changes that come. The final exception is one that many of us are familiar. When a person has a religious encounter after age 30, there is bound to be a radical shift in their thinking about life. That was the case with the Apostle Paul. He tells his story at least three times in the book of Acts and again shares parts of it several of his epistles, including the letter to Timoth we are reading today. As he shares his testimony, he comes away every thankful for the experience. I have to be honest with you, Paul does the exact opposite from what you would expect. Instead of seeing it as a negative, he embraces his, his new life and looks at it as an opportunity to witness. So maybe we need to take Paul's approach and find something to be thankful for. It is obvious that he's counting his blessings over the changes that has occurred in his life. In our text, he gives thanks to God for his new life because of what has happened. Many of us have our stories of life being before Christ. Someday we ought to sit around and tell our stories. Some may be, even be as dramatic as Paul's story. He tells how his life was turned upside down on the road to Damascus. Before meeting Christ, he thought of himself as a paragon of virtue, as a crusader for God. He was fighting on behalf of God. After the event, he sees himself as nothing more than a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence because of the change that has taken place in his life. A friend of mine told me about a man in his congregation who was a real saint. He was generous and loving. He was a real prayer warrior. One day, he and my friend were chatting and sharing some of their most experiences. My friend said he was shocked to hear the man's testimony. It included alcoholism, abusive behavior. It was a story of a family torn apart, marital infidelity. Then one day, everything changed. The man met Christ at a revival meeting, and he quit drinking, got a handle of, on his temple, on his timber and his tongue and started rebuilding his life. Every day now the man says, thank God I am not the man I was I used to be. I am not the man I used to be. So you can see the change. Sometimes we see these people on the street. You don't know their background because we see them for the first time. But if they give the testimony of how God has worked in their lives, you'll be shocked to hear about their testimony. Sometimes you would even prefer to say, I don't want to listen about their message because their testimony is too horrible. But I'm saying it is because of the change that has happened in their lives. That man has the same sense of humility, honestly, that Paul shares in his letter to Timon. Paul knew that it was to be under the ban of God's grace and mercy. Time after time, he declared that it was only by the grace of God that he was able to stand before the crowd to speak them. It is only by the grace of God that I'm also able to share the word of God. It is not of my own thing, my own doing. It is the grace of God. God has changed me. You see, God had done two things. First, he forgave Paul's past, allowing him to start over. This time, Paul was going to get it right. He was no longer bound by the errors of his ways. He was, as he was so eloquently put it in an earlier letter, a new creation. Brand new, born again. His past has no claim on him. He's now a new creation and he's able to say those words. Yet, he used his story to encourage others, to help them understand that people could change. Yes, we can change. Thank God we can change. We don't have to be the same old person. He tells Timothy that God could now use him as an example of what God wanted all of us to be. So, Paul was now used by God as an example of what people should, should be like. 
All needs change. This brings us to the second point. God gave him the ability to change. The new man was able to image with God's help. As the Holy Spirit entered him, Paul was now able to do far more for he ever dreamed possible. He thought it was impossible, but now it was possible. Paul wants us to know that that is why he says in another letter, all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. A funny thing happens when we begin to look at life this way. It reminds us that change can be good. It points us the fact that we don't have to remain the way we are. We can look ahead with thanksgiving and praise God that we aren't yet what we are going to be. So we need to give a testimony of who we are. If you have been ex exercising in order to lose weight, you will know that part of the philosophy involves imagining what you will feel like, look like, and be doing in the future. Weight loss always involves making change in your life. When you begin to imagine what the future will look like, you are halfway there. You are no longer bound by the past. If I look at myself, I look different because I am not what I was five years ago. Things have changed. It's because of exercise, because of other things. And I've managed. And I'm still saying, God had told me to conquer the weight that I had. And I've changed. And I think everyone can do the same. Paul knew this well. He lived with an eye to the future. He knew that he still had a way to grow in grace. He understood that he was going to change some more. He also knew that God was molding and shaping him through various things that would allow him to be a better servant. Paul knew that God is doing something. He's creating something. He's creating a new person in you. He's creating a new person in me. That is what God is doing. He has not yet finished with you. He's still working in you. So surrender your life to Christ so that Christ continues to work in you. We are growing and changing too. Our faith will be stronger and will be able to be more effective in our witness. If you are worried that you cannot quote the Bible like you want, or that you are too, too timid to get up and share your story, then just wait a little. As your faith develops, you will have your confidence. The confidence will come to you. You will start doing it. Paul used the illustration of being like little children in one of his letters. He suggests that maturity in faith takes time. We will grow into it. And here's more good news. If you have some thorn in the flesh like Paul, that is holding you back or getting you down. It shall pass. That still shall pass as well. For in the end, we shall all be transformed and ushered in the kingdom. When we suffer from disease and distress, it will not last forever. If we are being held back by some psychological baggage from our past or some physical problem, we'll be delivered from them. That is what God wants us. We will know people who have been ravaged by stroke and lay in bed paralyzed. Our faith tells us that they too will be changed. They shall be made well again. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, we will all be changed. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52. Thank God that in the last days, I will be changed as well. I will be changed. I wouldn't go to around eternity with this old body. I want to be able to move and play and dance again. Now that is something exciting to look forward if you are a Christian, if you know who you are. Okay, in conclusion, I'll say that brings me right back today. Knowing that our past is forgiven and that we have been changed is good news. Just knowing that our past is forgiven. Whatever I've done in the past has been forgiven. And I'm a new person. I'm a changed person. And I've, the good news is now helping me to grow in my new status. We can thank God for today as we recognize that no matter what shape we find ourselves, we have been promised a bright future. We can live life as it is, was meant to be lived. We can now live life with full vigor, power, because we know that it is no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. And that is very important for us to know. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. Which means when you see me, 
You should be able to say, yes, when I see you, I see Jesus Christ in you. We should be like that. Too many people are either preoccupied with the past or worrying about the future. They never get to rejoice in the present. Paul's message here points out this important truth. He begins the passage by thanking God for his calling. He loves the ministry and knows that God has prepared him to do just what he's doing. He is now fully engaged in the present moment. Amen to that church. Don't get all preoccupied with the things that doesn't matter, with your past or what will happen of your future because your life is in Christ. He holds your future. He knows what you are going through. So don't worry about all other things. As long as you surrendered your life in Christ, you should not worry about anything because your life is in Christ. He is the one that matters. I'm not worried about the past. I'm not worried about the future. For I know the person who knows the future is the one I believe in. So, brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you. Please surrender your life to Christ. You become a new person. No worries about anything because your life is in someone who is greater, who has created the world, who says, please surrender your worries and I will take control of your life. May God bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Okay, let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you, loving Father. We thank you for everything. We thank you just for loving us, for loving me. Enough to visit your creation in the person of Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he loved us enough to die for us on the cross so that we might live with him into eternity. Thank you that Jesus is truly our glorious king of all the ages, deserving all of our love and praise through time into eternity. Praise the glorious name forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, it's time again to say thank you, Lord. You cannot thank God unless your life has been changed. When your life has been changed, you know that all these things that we have is nothing. It's meaningless without God. So whatever you have, you always say thank God. So you can thank God for what God has done to you. So it's time for us to give our thanksgiving offering. Let us thank God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful and wonderful life that you've given us. We thank you that without you, we can't do anything. But with you, we are more than conquerors. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that we've surrendered our lives in you. That whatever we do, we do it for your glory. For us to live, it's you. May you bless this offering, Lord Jesus Christ, because we've given it from the bottom of our hearts, knowing that we own nothing, and it is only to you that we give these offerings. May you bless it, Father, in the name of of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you too.